All right. I'm live. Um, family, give me a second um, to get started. I'm going to send the link out for a few to a few links. I'm running kind of behind. Been out shooting ball with my dad. So I'm kind of running behind. Just got to the house. Bear with me for about five or six minutes. But until then, just uh, check out this music real quick until I invite some people and I'll get started in, uh, in about five minutes. Broken community. Wow. My vision blurry, my thoughts merge into each other and they form a swirly. I zone into a mode and wonder how I got here. I'm looking for the signs of nothing's looking quite clear. I heard that I came from history. How's my people living in broken communities? How you free yourself that don't know the embodies? How we gonna be free not knowing where to buy is? Give me the goddamn truth. Sick of all the lies, I need the goddamn truth. Yeah, I want the goddamn truth. I know that I came from a great legacy, so you know what I'm going to test. 
have in my seed. It's my new, a whole different recipe. Oh yeah, you and your wife are about to see. Now, now you are staring at greatness. I know the world is limited, people gon' hate this. They get mad when you focus and you got a purpose. And baby, but it ain't over. I know you're nervous. Now, now you are staring at greatness. I know the world is limited, people gon' hate this. It's my brain, no Smith and Wesson. Uh-huh. Living legend, power in my speech. We was by the strong, get the weakest link. I'm energy and motion, feel me when I'm walking by. I'm true self, true says you believe in lies. He's down so low, he don't even believe in lies. So I cried, nobody's listening. All the protection to me is pollution. So stop pitching and start a new revolution. My willpower make it rain on the sunny day. And God we trust, yeah, this is what the money say. I'm a calculator, something ain't acting right. I'm not Because I came from the gutter, and I'm still. All right. Just trying to share for to a few groups and invite a few people in. I'm gonna go ahead and uh get started. I'm running behind. Peace, uh, brother Jadar, Hotel, uh, Sunshine. Hotel in at least if y'all still on here. I'm running a little bit late, but uh <coughs> I wanna say ETM Hotel. Um do I do I heck a new in I'm in Ra Kwa E uh Sekum uh Majube Iba E uh Igungun Kiki Igungun Fapmo Iwa Pele Fapmo uh Alafie uh I ain't get dunked. <laughs> I ain't get dunked on. I'm smelling. I wish I could have had time to take a shower. I thought I was gonna be back in time uh, to take a shower and get something to eat before I got started. But I've been out um, balling. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, jump into uh, the presentation. Um, uh, I know Sean, you banned from uh, um, actually inviting. Uh, Sending uh, uh, links out to other people, but if uh, Senator Lisa and Brother Jadar, if you can, I, I sent out what I could real quick, but I want to jump in, jump in and go ahead and get started. I uh, sent them out to a few links, but I didn't send them out to all. Uh, I think I sent it to NBK Live. Uh, approve that for me, uh, San Sean. The N- NBK Live, I, it had to be approved. So approve that for me if you don't mind. Um, I sent it to other few, but. I'm finna get started. Those that jump in, jump in. But uh, I'm ready to rock and roll, man, and get done with this presentation here. Um, give me one second. Share my screen. All right. I'm jump right into it. Um, y'all are gonna be looking at a few uh, uh slides I did yesterday. Okay. 
and run it. Man in the full knowledge of himself is a superb and supreme picture of creation. When man becomes possessor of the knowledge of himself, he becomes master of his environment, the captain of his own ship, the director of his own destiny, the accomplisher of his own ends. Man should understand himself because man is full of knowledge, and this knowledge is a gift of nature. When Mother Nature created man, she deprived him of nothing. He was given the faculty of understanding all things around him. This faculty for understanding has not been taken away from him. None of his senses have been taken away from him. So there is no excuse for the black man. Bridge my team, rim like the green, queen, the king, salute, now spring, I see. Spring from the beginning, I see. I'm ripping my team, red, black, and green, queen, and king, salute, now spring, I shake, green, purple, and blue, and I shake, fire, purple, and blue, and I shake. All right. Um, a presentation <clears throat> today is uh, I'm a Star Revolt and the Fearless Sync Pay Piggy presentation. This is part two. Last night I did, um, last night I did, um, um, part one. This is part two. Part one, I talked about uh, the revolt or the insurrection on the boat. Um, talked about Sing Pay, uh, Sing Sing Bay. Uh, Pehi, who orchestrated uh, the revolt on the La Amistad uh, schooner ship uh, last night, talked about the abolish movement, uh, those who started the, uh, the, um, the Amistad committee who came in defense of um, these 53 uh, Africans, West Africans that was kidnapped uh, from Sierra Leone and um, took into to La Pombo. Uh, and then boarded the ship of La Amistad onto Puerto Rico uh, principles who uh, these Africans uh, revolted against, went on a zigzag shore, supposed to have been on shore for two, three days, but the trip ended up to be three months and they ended up in New York City uh, in Long Island and the ship was taken over by the USS uh, Washington by Lieutenant uh, Commander Jotney and Judge Johnson aborted the ship and uh, uh, set up a court date, were examined the uh, Amistad, set up a court date and were charging the Africans with murder and uh, piracy for killing the captain of the La Amistad and the Captain Cook, uh, uh, Cestinio, if I'm pronouncing his name, um, <clears throat> from right. So um, I may be missing a few things, but if uh, you missed the presentation, go back and check out the presentation. Um, this is part two. We're going to be talking about the court cases. Other, uh, I mean, other, uh, other uh, West Africans um, who involved in the, uh, talk a little bit more about who involved in the case and some of these events that transpired um, after uh, the revolt on the La Amistad. Uh, peace, uh, Sherman. Latang, Latang, if I'm saying your name right. Uh, peace, peace. All right, before I get started, uh, I am a part of a group called the Masi Warrior Clan, and uh, my uh, brother, my sin, my Aru Kurini, uh, which means brother also, uh, Shin Shan uh, coined the phrase for the group, let's go to war. And we are at war uh, with our culture, with our history, with our tradition, with our legacy, uh, and so forth. So here's the chant. This is something we do before we get started. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, so let's go to war. Uh, peace, uh, hotel up to you. Uh, I am my brother's keeper. Uh, Senate Lisa, I'm gonna have to go back in. I ain't went back in and changed anything on there or try to fix what was on there, but hopefully next show you'll have a wrench, by, <laughs> a wrench by your name. You and Sunshine, I I put them by a few people name. I don't know why they's not showing up on everybody's uh name that um I uh, made moderators in the group. All right, this is my disclaimer. This is a disclaimer um that I give on every presentation before I get started. It is said it says. I am not a teacher, but merely a student sharing information. And that information provided is for the educational purpose only. And if you are in doubt, do the research or have it verified by someone qualified. I reserve the right to change the focus of this presentation to shut down, sell, or exchange the terms of the use at my own discretion. Our trademark, design rights, copyrights, registers, names, models, logos, avatars, the sigmas, and marks used are cited by this website are uh, the property of these respective owners. I reserve the right to add information as it comes available and or adapt changes to improve information as it comes available in the future. Inputs wanted, changes, additions, deletions, or encourage. This is my saying. As I learn, we all learn. I believe that if we uh, attain any type of knowledge or information, we should pass it down to our families, to our friends, to our loved ones, to our neighbors, to uh, people in our society, people in our community, and so forth. I think this is the only way we'll be able to go with passing down, learning and passing down information. So as I learn, we all learn. All right. Um, this is the first trial. As I uh, showed you back, I'll go back a little bit further from the last presentation. Um, I showed you the three judges. So these are the three judges. This is from the last presentation that I did on yesterday. This is part one. But this, they went through, you You had the first case, which went through the circuit court, uh, which is by this judge. Then you had Andrew Johnson. He was the individual after the ship was seized by the lieutenant commander, uh, Gottney, um, um, the, on, the, on the ship of the USS Washington. Um, he came aboard the lot Amistad, examined uh, what was on the boat, and uh, took the testimony of Montez and Ruins, who was the Spaniards who illegally purchased these 53 uh, Africans. But going back, if we, uh, if you looked at the presentation from yesterday, ten, two of the uh, Afri West Africans were killed uh, after they revolted on the La Amistad ship. So two was killed um, by the captain um, doing um, the insurrection of, uh, of the uh, West Africans taking over uh, the ship. And then due to them supposed to have been a three day trip going to uh, Puerto Rico Princess, uh, after they took over the ship, they set sail um, uh, Singpe, uh, Singpe Pei, uh, told Montez to turn the ship around and head east. The sun rises in the east, so he wanted the ship to go in the east back in the other direction. They wanted to go home. But at nighttime, Montez would trick them and would turn the ship around. So I showed you a map and I showed you this zigzag pattern that they took on the Atlantic Ocean, which supposed to have been a three-day trip turned into a two-month trip. And then they ended up in the United States of America in New York and Long uh, and Long Island, and within the two month trip, they had enough food. They didn't have enough food for two months because again, they was on supposed to have been a, a three day trip. So ten other Africans died while on a ship for starvation and thirst. So you got two that was killed, ten that died from third th uh, 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 starvation and thirst by the time that they made it to uh, uh, the Americas, uh, and then later on. Uh, we're going to find out in this presentation we had several others that died because after Andrew Johnson aborted the ship, he had those Africans arrested and put in jail and to be tried by the government of the United States. So he set up a court day. The first trial would go through the circuit court. So certain things happened in the circuit court and then, uh, then they had to go to the district court. So when they got to the district court, they seen Andre, Andrew uh, T. Johnson. 
and then something happened in the district court, then they had to go to the Supreme Court. So this is the Joseph story, who was the uh, uh, the judge that presided over the third the third uh, third court case. Uh, I showed you these. Uh, uh, these are some of the uh, sketchings from William H. Townsend that I showed in the last presentation. If you didn't look at it, uh, um, so I showed you some sketchings. I, I, I mentioned him briefly, uh, Fully, who is also um, uh, from Mende, um, uh, uh, Lick Cal, who, who also is from Mende, which is in Sierra Leone. They are a, 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 a part of the Mende people. And this brother, this young individual was very vital um, uh, and very knowledgeable and caught on quick to English uh, uh, and interpreting things real quick. Um, here I, I talked about Marquis real quick. She is one of the three girls that was bought by Montez. Montez bought four uh, children. He bought Kale, which was the one boy, and he bought three girls. He bought four and all for $1,300. And then you had Montez who bought 49 Africans um, for $450 a piece. So these are some of majority of the people that was on the lot. I'm going to start just reading some things um, um, were many people. You had some people that was outside, I mean, that was in the surrounding areas of Sierra Leone and Liberia who were not many people, the Kono people you had, uh, and it was another group of people that was on the board, but majority of overall the people that was on the board was many people. And the few that was from uh, another exit group in Sierra Leone and Liberia was also uh, had to learn uh, Mindy while they was on the ship, which it didn't take too long. And then the presentation that I'm going to do um, here on the Mossy Warrior channel in the next week or so, uh, um, and I don't really have a title for it yet, but it's dealing with the Gala people in Sierra Leone and Liberia and also in Angola, which is in Central Africa, these people, and I, I talked about it on the Bundo slash Sandy Society, where I mentioned the Kissy people, uh, the Kono people, the Gala people, the Basa people, the Mendi people. A lot of these people was in Sierra Leone and Liberia, and a lot of these people integrated their cultures and tradition and became one group of people, um, which I'll touch on on that presentation that I do in the next week or so. So he's our, here are some more um, of the sketchings that the brother did. This was a guy here that was second in charge of Sing Pei, Pei who we know who led the revolt, who's, who broke free uh, by uprooting a, a, a nail and actually freeing himself with the nail uh, and unshackling himself and then unshackling the other, uh, the 53 uh, Africans that was on the La Amistad and then they, uh, uh revoked it uh on this slave on the slave ship a few more so let's get on back into the presentation so here is the first trial which would take place in the circuit court so uh first the first trial in september the 14th in september the 14th all of the prisoners uh accepted one who was too ill to travel were removed removed from New Haven to Hartford, the captain of Connecticut, where the trial opened in September the 17th. With Judge Smith Thompson, the individual, the first judge that I showed you that presiding in the circuit court. Uh, presiding after three days of legal battling, the judge rendered his opinion. The circuit court had no jurisdiction over the charges of murder and piracy. So again, just reiterating, if you didn't look at the first presentation, the Africans was charged with murder and piracy because they killed uh, a Pharaoh who was the captain who owned the La Amistad, the scooter ship. I even talked about the scooter ship. Uh, the Dutch used the scooter ship uh, in the 16 and 1700s. And then uh, Pharaoh bought the La Amistad, the scooter ship from the uh, United States of America. We know in the 18th century, uh, the United States uh, advanced the schooner ship, uh, and they started back. It was very vital, uh, uh, um, 
uh, the, the uh, Great Britain used the schooner ship um, um, also. So I talked about that a little bit. Um, also, I'm missing something. Oh, Montez and Ruins, just reiterating. I, I talked about in the first presentation, the Anglo-Spanish Treaty of 1817 and 1833. So, and uh, slavery was not abolished, but in 1817 or earlier than that, 1807, Great British abolished trafficking slaves across the Atlantic Ocean. 1817, they set up a treaty with Spain. Then later on, a treaty with Portuguese, a treaty with the Dutch, and a treaty with the uh, with the United States of America. So they abolishing kidnapping slaves or kidnapping our ancestors from West Africa and trafficking them across the Atlantic Ocean to these to uh, different places. So they broke the treaty. So they set up these fraudulent birth certificates and these fraudulent passports because they knew that they was breaking the law. But they had another hand. There was another guy who, who was in the pot, another guy from the United States that we're going to talk about who came to uh, who was also supposed to have been over to oversee that none of these things was going to happen because they had a treaty with the United States. The United States abolished trafficking uh, uh, our ancestors across the Atlantic Ocean, kidnapping them and the trafficking them across the Atlantic Ocean as well. So. We're going to talk about this guy who had his hand in the pot, also who knew some of these things were going on and was not supposed to have been letting these things uh, happen. Just reiterating so, a few things. All right. All right. Uh, the circuit court had no jurisdiction over the charges of murder and piracy. Since alleged crimes were committed on the Spanish ship and the Spanish waters, the various property claims, including ruins and Montez claims to the African slaves, should be decided in the district court and writ of a habitus corpus for the release of the small girls was rejected. So we know that Monte, Monte, uh, Ruins, he purchased 49 slaves, including Cinque Pei. And we know Montez purchased four children, three girls and one boy. So now they were trying to get the release of the children, but they rejected the release of the children. And the West Africans was being charged with murder and piracy Why Montez and Ruins was set free by Judge Johnson once he came onto the ship after it was sieged by the U.S. Washington. Now, as soon as the circuit court adjourned, Judge Johnson convened in the district court. So now they went from the district court because Judge uh, Smith, I mean, Joseph, Smith did not want uh was um actually saying something about um the legal battle uh his his opinion it shouldn't have been in in uh the circuit court uh they didn't have no jurisdiction or whatever so he turned it over to the district court so once he turned it over to the district court who will be the judge will be uh Andrew T Johnson as soon as the circuit court of John judge Johnson convened a district court in the same room. He decreed that the property claims needed more investigation, but the captives could be released on bail based on their appraised values as the slaves on the Cuban market. The defense lawyer rejected the bail formula, which implied that the Amistad Africans were slaves and the captains were returned, uh, returned to prison. So they were trying to get bail for them, but they were still, uh, he want, he, uh, the judge needed more evidence to, uh, to render if these Africans were kidnapped illegally or they was born on a plantation and Montez and Ruins was taking them to another place. So they was trying to uh, uh, get everything together to, to see was these guys uh, af uh, actually kidnapped or they was actually born on, on, on a plantation by these by uh, the guy that uh, purchased them. J.W. Gibbs, a professor of theology, a sacred literature at Yale Divinity School, and a lot of these individuals that we, I'm talking about, um, again, they went to Yale for, for like I said, most of the, uh, you'll see these so-called uh, scholars and intellectuals and uh, so forth, 
go to Oxford or Cambridge. But here I'm seeing Yale, Yale a whole lot with a lot of individuals that's involved in the Amistad case. Uh, took great interest in the Amistad case. He learned to count from one to 10 in Mindy and on with his new knowledge, proceeded to the New York docks, counting to every African sailor he met. So this is a, prof a, a professor here. He was also hired by the Amistad Committee. You had Tabin, you had uh, uh, Leviticus and a, and a reverend and a, a white preacher. I can't remember his name at the time, but those was the abolishers who actually started the Amistad Committee. They came in the offense to help these uh, Africans who were over here, who was being charged with murder and piracy. So they wanted to they wanted to get the perspective or build a case from the Africans' own words, but the Africans could not speak English. So the professor he learned how to speak, how to count, basically uh, one to ten in Mindy. So they was he uh, so they had a plan to go out on the docks. Uh, because at this point in time, you had many free Africans that was actually uh, a part of the military, the, uh, the United States military at this time. You had different ethnic groups. So they decided to go out once he, he counted to go out and start counting one to 10 speaking in Mindy and maybe somebody would acknowledge him uh, for speaking in this language to interpret these individual cases so they can hear it, hear the side of the Africans and not just the side of Ruins and Montez, these Spaniards who Judge Johnson only uh, heard one side and that was the Spaniards who were saying that they were slaves. They were not kidnapped and they was born on their plantations and they was going somewhere else. His effort uh, in New York down County, every African slave he met, his effort paid divinities uh, divins within early October. He found James Convey, a seaman on a British warship buzzer, who could understand him. Professor Gibbs took uh, Convey to see the Amistad captains in the new. I found this on. The oh, Siri done jumped in, y'all. <laughs> uh, uh, who found and understand him, Professor Gibbs took convey to see his Amistad captain in the New Haven jail. This is where the Africans was jailed that after the, uh, after the ship was seized. And the Africans shouted for joy when they heard convey speak in Mende. Because uh, over majority of the people on the La Amistad was, the, uh, was, uh, was of the Mende people in Sierra Leone. Only a few who was in the surrounding areas of Liberia and Sierra Leone, which was other ethnic, ethnic groups who learned to speak Mindy while aboard the La Amistad. They could not relate their version of the event. Now here is James Convey. This is the professor after he went on this dock and they he's counting in Mindy and Mindy, he's finally got somebody to bite with this individual who, this, uh, this individual here. John Cave. This is just a lit drawing or a sketch of, of him here. Uh, James Convey, an interpreter for Africans in the apparent about 20 years of age, was born in Barende in the Mindy country. His father was a Kono descendant and his mother was Gissi. Convey uh, was taken by three men in the evening from his parent house at Golahong, whether they had removed when he was quite young, he was carried to Baluma country and sold as a slave to the Bayimi, the king of Balumos, and who resided at Mani. He lived there for three years and was employed to uh, employ to plant rice for the wife of Bayimi. And you're going to see that Sierra Leone in Liberia, majority of those different ethnic groups, whether you're talking about the Basa people, whether you're talking about the Timni people, whether you're talking about the Mindi people, whether you're talking about the Gala people, uh, the Via people, and so forth, these ethnic groups within Sierra Leone and Liberia had, uh, were farmers. These people were farmers, and uh, majority they had uh, rice, rice uh, uh, farms. 
And I'm going to talk about these rice farms when we get to the Gala people, because the Gala people presided in Seir. It was a split. So the Gala people uh, was in Sierra Leone and Liberia, and it said that they came from Nedongo. Nadango is the name of Angola. We know that the Portuguese named Nadango Angola or Nadango became uh, 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 a certain area or a certain section for the governors who they allowed these Portuguese to come into the Congo. That's a whole nother story or you can go to my Congo series. Um, it's three of them. I can't remember the name of them. The warrior king of Nadango, uh, Portuguese, uh, Portuguese in the Congo and the Congo Kingdom. So if you miss those uh, presentations, you can go back and check those presentations and, and, and I, and I, I kind of talk about it and who's those governors uh, and so forth uh, were. But you will hear me talk about these the, the, these uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia with these uh, form, uh, uh, rice forms later on because it was instrumental to the Gala people who came out of Sierra Leone and went into Georgia and went into South Carolina and North Carolina. But that's the next presentation um, that I'll be doing, which will be on the Masi Warrior Clan, which after being out about for four days, La Bongo was captured by British. And this was the notorious uh, uh, slave fortresses that uh, also Singpe and the 53 other Africans went to where they was boarded on the Takara ship and this is where they went to this notorious La Combo uh, 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 slave fortress. And then they were set uh, on, then they were sold, and then they was put on the La Amistad and was going to Puerto Rico, but insert, they in, uh, uh, revolted and they ended up in America, ended up the three day trip, ended up into two months, and they ended up here. But this is the same place that John Convey, the interpreter, went. He was captured by a British armed vessel and carried to a Sierra Leone. Convey thus obtained freedom and remained in this place five or six years and was taught to read and write in English language in the schools of the church missionary societies. Convey's original name was Kawi Lee. So we, again, we know once we was kidnapped, we know they stripped us of a thorough knowledge of ourselves. They stripped us of our names. They script us of our culture, our traditions, our morals, our ethics, our, our edicts, and our spirituality, and so forth. And they will replace our names with one of their Christians' names. So his real name, John Convey's real name was Ka Wee Lee, which signifies in Mindy, war road, i.e. a road dangerous to the past for fear of being taken captive. His Christian name, James, was given by his Reverend J.W. Weeks, a church missionary in Sierra Leone. This is nothing new. In November 1838, he enlisted as a sailor on board a British bridge of the War Buzzard, commanded by Captain Fitz Fitzgerald. It was on board of the vessel when the New York on October, 8, uh, October 1839, James was found amid some 20, 20 native Africans and by the ki ki kindness of the Captain Fitzgerald, his service as an interpreter was procured. A lot of these people came from all over West Africa and ended up having to develop insight in a pot of cultural mixed people. That's, that's a fact. Today name is a culture, a culture Jason. All right. Here is a deposition. Uh, I took a little screenshot, cut it out. This is a deposition on behalf of James Convey. Once he uh, went in and talked to uh, the Mindy people uh, in the Mindy language, he was able to get a side of the story uh, from them. And before he was in the court, uh, uh, he gave a deposition of what these individuals were saying. So this is the writing of the deposition of what John Convey gave to the courts. All right. This here is an article of the Spaniards ruins in Montez description, an article prepared by the emancipator concerning the action of John B. Burroughs, who was the counsel of George Ruiz, who purchased 49, 48 slaves 
plus Sing Pei Pei, which made 49, and Pedro Montes, who purchased four African children, three girls and one boy, in the chambers of Judge Elinkis of the New York Courts of Common Pleas. So here is uh uh um this um article here from ruins and what's the name from the council pleading to the courts that these Africans need to be tried uh in uh, uh uh in Spain they need to be tried for the crime that they committed on the Atlantic Ocean they need to be returned immediately to them and the ship and the property that was or, or the cargo that was on the ship immediately and returned to Spain so these Africans can can um can be tried by a jury over there. In collection, slavery in the US Supreme Court of the Amistad case. The Amistad committee was not happy with the treatment of the captives and began efforts to provide for their physical well-being and their intellectual and religious instruction. Reverend George Day, a former professor at the New York Institution for the Deaf and Dumb, was employed to supervise the instructions of the Mendy captives by the Yale Divinity School students. The teachers began their instructions with a simple pictures and sign language. By this time, several captives have already died in custody from the lingering effects of exposure, hunger, dehydration, suffering aboard the Amistad. Now, as the case was going forward, right, you had, they hired the Amistad Committee, which was these white abolishers. Um, they uh, brung in a P Professor Gibbs, and Professor Gibbs learned how to speak Mindy, uh, count the Mindy from one to 10, went aboard the docks, uh, uh, where the sailors was and was counting one to ten and Mindy trying to see if somebody he would catch the attention of somebody and later on he began he caught the attention of John Convey who became the in interpreter uh, interpreter and also uh, uh, presented a deposition uh, screenshot that I showed you the deposition to the courts and then he brought on Reverend George Day who also taught them as well as Professor George how to uh uh read write and uh by certain pictures and signs and so forth so george ray came from this instant of uh, this deaf uh deaf institution and he was also uh hired to supervise professor gibbs students who also was educating these uh individuals and also the reverend george day and another reverend uh, Reverend, um, Reverend Charles Bennett Ray, who also was a Reverend, who also was there teaching them about the Bible, about Christianity, which we see this uh, all throughout uh, the historical data, whether uh, we on, uh, 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 whether they're on our soil or we're somewhere else. You have missionaries, Reverends that come in, uh, try to eradicate the identity and say, hey, this, your way is not the way and our way is is the way so they begin to convert or christianize these individuals while they are in the united states so you had reverend george who also taught them how to do sign language uh uh more sign language uh understand through pictures as well as reverend charles bennett ray who also taught them and also taught them uh the bible as well as they got john convey a uh, mindy who also who became the interpreter he also taught them certain books from out of the bible so you can see them converting them as well as educating them depending on the spaniard governor the spanish governor had put forward a certain demand to the united states even before the Hartford trial the spanish minister de la bacar wrote to the secretary to a secretary of the state john Forcing a former minister of Spain and known to defend the Negro slavery, and that when the Amistad was rescued, she should have been free to return to Cuba so that the Africans on board could have been tried by the proper tribunal. So now you had the counselor of the lawyers from uh, uh, Montez 
and ruins who also i showed you um that position that they put forth to the court demanding that these africans the slave ships and the cargo be returned to them and they be returned to spain uh for legal actions and the africans be tried for murder and piracy um there but all along we know that montez and ruins broke the angle which is nothing new broke the anglo uh spaniard treaty of 1817 and 1835 which was they abolished not abolishing slavery but they was abolishing trafficking slaves across the atlantic ocean kidnapping and trafficking them across the atlantic ocean was a bit was abolished so they had broke the law there which they had broke the law in humoral law anyway by kidnapping humans working them treating them as livestock uh and so forth so now you have the, the the minister from spain who have come also now and he is now also demanding that these africans be returned and the ship and the cargo be returned and these africans be tried over there and not in the united states the negro slave that the amistad was rescued she should have been set free to return to cuba so that the africans on board could have been tried by the proper tribunal and by the violating laws of the country which they are subject this had been done and so he put forward a further set of demands he claimed the vessel and cargo including the africans in the name of spanish monarchy de demanding that they be sent back to havana to uh, adjudication since no tribunal in you in the united states has the right to institute proceedings against or to impose penalties upon and this is what uh 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 joseph thompson the judge that was in the circuit court was talking about the subjects of spain for the crime this is why i was turned over to the district court by judge andrew t johnson crimes committed on board of the spanish vessel and the waters of the spain territory the U.S. President Martin Van Buren had no strong views on slavery question, but he demand on a support. He demand on the support of the Southern pro-slavery de uh, Democrats, who goodwill he wishes to maintain for the upcoming president election of 1840. He uh, therefore told Forsyth on September the 11th to uh, instruct District Attorney William S. Hollenberg to take care of the no uh, of that the proceedings of the circuit court or any other judicial tribunal place the vessel cargo or slaves be under control of the federal executive the president hoped that the courts would order the Amistad captives to be returned to cuba thus relieving him of the political pressure from both the southern democrats and the spanish government but he was prepared to return the captives on his own authority if necessary. So the president at this time, Van Martin Burnham, he did not, here is this wicked man here. He, we'll talk about him a little bit. He did not want uh, them to win the court case. He, he had pressure coming from the Spaniard um, minister and he had pressure coming from the South. So elections were coming up and he wanted to win the election from the South, but he messed up with the North by demonstrating these certain things to try to sabotage the court case of these Africans to be sent back. And regardless of what the courts uh, ruled, he was determined to send these people back so that he can get, uh, so that he can win the vote from the South. But he ended up messing himself up in the North because of, of the dirty things that he was doing to try to get these, uh, uh, the not giving these Africans due process of the law. Oh, shoot. So this is the president of the United States at this time when he uh doing the Amistad trial. Then, uh, uh, the Amistad incident placed Byrne in a precautious situation. He had to receive a direct request from the Spanish government to return the Africans back to Cuba. And if he allowed the trial to move forward, he risked 
losing the support, which I talk about the Southern voters on whom he depend for the re-election. The Amistad committee was painful aware that the president policy aimed at condemning the African captives of permitting slavery or possible death and the abolishers worked out a defense strategy to ensure that the verdict did not go against them. So the Amistad committee, which is tabbing Leviticus, Leviticus and I can't remember the Reverend uh, at this name, uh, at this point, God, what is his name? I hate, I'm forgetting uh, this other individual name. Um, but I talked about him in the first presentation as well as the other uh, two lawyers that was with Roger Baldwin. Um, uh, Rev, uh, not Reverend, but um, who was they? Ther uh, uh, Theodore Sedwich, uh and Reverend Charles Bennett Ray, who was also a, a, a lawyer uh, in their defense. Well, actually, Baldwin just got legal advice uh, from them and Baldwin actually did, um, all of the work. I talked about him and showed a picture of him in the last presentation. They put up a case and they, once they found out about what was going on with the president and the president was trying to do whatever he can in his power to get the ship, the cargo and the slaves back to, uh, uh, to Montez and Marquez and took back to be tried. So they was trying to figure out a way and a good defense uh, in behalf of the uh, Africans when they go to the district court. They built up a case around the argument that the Africans were not legally slaves. And as they had been brought to Havana and sold their contrary to the Anglo-Spanish Treaty of 1820, which I talked about 1817, 1820, 1833 and 1835. I touched on all of that, those treaties. Uh, in the first presentation. Which prohibited the transatlantic slave trade. These treaties had been reaffirmed in 1835 and followed by the royal order from the Queen of Spain in 1838, directing the Captain General of Cuba to enforce the laws with the strongest zeal. W.R.R. R. Madden, a native island who had served the British government in the Gold Coast of Ghana and Havana, Cuba, as a commissioner on the Court of Mixed Commission, or uh, for suppressing the slave trade. Okay, this individual here also gonna throw a monkey wrench in the game because now you got the president trying to heck is under the pressure because re-election is coming over. So he don't want to lose the vote from the South. And he has pressure coming down from uh, Montez and Ruins lawyer demanding uh, the ship, the cargo, the property back and he also have Spain minister who has come and now is demanding the same thing of uh, the the uh, uh, the kidnap victims, this uh, the La Amistad ship, the cargo uh, to be returned, and these uh, Africans be tried for murder and and uh and piracy. But this individual, he's gonna throw a monkey wrench and also help Louis Tybee, who is the leader of the Amistad Committee, who the Amistad Committee became the American Missionary Society later on, and they set up uh, a lot of missionary schools in Liberia and Sierra Leone after this case were over with. But we'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. So Dr. Madden came to New York uh, in November and he met with Louis Tabby. Remember, he is the leader of the Amistad Committee. He is an abolitionist, right? He wanted to see the captains at New Haven and proceeded to offer to give evidence at the trial. Since the trial had been deferred, he had, because there was something going on with uh, another uh, person that was supposed to be involved in the case. I think he got sick and they had to um, uh, defer the trial to a later date. He had to give testimony to Judge Johnson in his chambers. Excuse me. So he gave a testimony to Judge Johnson in his chambers, and then he gave a testimony uh, once uh, they resided back in uh, 
the the second uh, court case, which will be in the district court. They went in the court circuit court first by Joseph with Judge Joseph Thompson, and then they are going into the second court case, which is presided by Andrew T. Johnson, who is in the district court. So he's going to give his testimony. So we're going to talk about what his testimony was. And it also helped their case, you know, also. Dr. Madden argued that the Amistad captives were recently importees, meaning he was saying that, hey, look, these guys on this ship was kidnapped from Sierra Leone. They was kidnapped. They was never in the possession of Montez and Ruins before uh, 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 doing the treaty, uh, the Anglo-Spanish uh, uh, treaty, the treaty between Great Britain, the treaty against Spain, Portuguese, the Dutch, uh, in the United States, they recently kidnapped them. So they, these Spaniards are breaking the law on the license for the transporting them for Havana, the port, Puerto Rico princes. They had been entered as Ladinos, i.e., slaves brought to Cuba before 1820. But Mandy pointed out that these types of fraudulence was common practice in Cuba and that ruins and Montez papers of ownerships were not legally valid. So they orchestrated these birth certificates for these Africans, these 53 Africans that was aboard the La Amistad. And remember, once they got over here, they changed Sinkpe Pei name real quick, this Joseph Sinkwe on the birth certificate, you know, to try to Make it that, okay, we named him. He was already born on our plantation and so forth. So he's telling them that they had just been recently kidnapped and was and, and these guys breaking the law. And it was nothing new to create fraudulent paperwork about the time Ruins and Montez was arrested. This time they was arrested in New York and charged as assault, kidnapping, and false imprisonment brought against them. Because in the beginning, once the ship was seized by the U.S. Washington by the Lieutenant Commander uh, Godney, and he uh, got a hold of the district attorney and so forth, and they got Judge Johnson, Andrew Thompson, I mean Andrew T. Uh, Johnson, to aboard the La Amistad to examine the ship and to get the testimony from Ruins and Montez, who was the Spaniards who bought them. Um, he let them free and he charged the, uh, 53 Africans where well, at the time it wasn't 53. Cause again, two was killed during the insurrection and then 10 died aboard the ship through starvation because Puerto, they supposed to have been going to Puerto Rico princess, which was supposed to last three days on the, uh, they was there on the uh, Atlantic ocean for two months. Uh, Hotep and Pool, uh, uh, and Puma, I appreciate you joining. Um, so now they are being arrested after the testimony of 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 uh R. R. Madden. All right, now Twist, this individual here, Nicholas Philip Twist, Twist was appointed a U.S. consul. So let's say, let's you know, and again, I'm not trying to insult anybody intelligence because on the first presentation i started out with the atlantic slave trade just simplifying it real quick and i know a lot of people that watch my presentations and go back and look at my presentations are highly intelligent or very i mean are intellectuals but again it's not only people that are intellectuals and highly intelligent that look at my video you have those that are just trying to come into the information uh trying to understand certain things so i try to break things down it's as simple as possible for a baby to understand so i may reiterate things i might show throw definitions out there i may talk about things that people might say hey i already know about that why are you talking about that shoot that ain't nothing but again we have some people who are just coming into the knowledge trying to find out things that are not highly uh highly read as i would say so a console an official appointed by a government 
to live in a foreign city and protect and promote a government citizen and interest there. So this individual was appointed. He was appointed by the president. And he was an a, 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 a official. And he he went, these consuls went to live in foreign cities and to protect and promote the government for the citizens of the interest. So his job was to go there to make sure that these things ain't happening, that people are not illegally uh, creating fraudulent documents. People are not going into Africa and kidnapping uh, human beings and trafficking them across the Atlantic Ocean. So this was his job. Did he do his job? No, he didn't do his job. So let's see. Twist was appointed as a U.S. consul in Havana, Cuba, by the President Jackson. At this time, President Jackson was the president. Shortly after arriving there in 1833, Twist invested in sugar plantation deal that went bad. And we know on the islands at this point of time, sugar was booming. They was coming in and they was taking us from West Africa as well as Central Africa to these plantations, these sugar plantations, the sugar cane plantation. So sugar was popping at this time. According to the members, uh, hold on, Twist invested in the sugar plantation deal that went bad. He made no secrets of his pro-slavery views. According to the members of the British Commission, sent by Cuba to investigate the violations of the treaty ending in African slave trade. Twist became corruptly involved in the cre creation of the false documents designed to mass illegal sales of Africans into bondage. For a time, Twist also served as a consul in Cuba for Portugal, another country whose national Nationals were uh, active in illegal slave trade. So again, those treaties, the Anglo-Spanish treaties, the treaties were set up by Great Britain, Spain, Portugal, the Dutch, and the United States. So he was a consul for the United States as well as a consul for Cuba, for Portugal. And he was supposed to be there making sure no illegal activities of the things supposed to be going on, and he got his hands all tied into it. So this was also information that Dr. Madding or R.R. Madding was bringing out that this was nothing new. Of uh, this was going, this 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 stuff has been going on. Fraudulent documents being created. The uh, people. Uh, going into Africa and illegal kidnapping and trafficking them across the Atlantic Ocean, this is nothing new. And I'm going to tell you who has his hands in it, who's benefiting from it, who our government sought to be a consul over there to make sure that, I, that the United States does not break these treaties. But he had his hands all tied into it. All right. All right, now we're into the second trial. The second trial again was by the, is in the district court, right? So the U.S. District Court opened in Hartford, Connecticut, on November the 19th, 1839, to hear the case, but they adjourned to January because of the absence of certain cardinal witnesses. In the interim, the Spain minister pressed his claims once again. So the the, the minister of Spain is putting pressure. On the president, president, let's go back, President Martin Van Buren, who election was coming up again, and he wanted to make sure that he win the vote from the South, and he wanted to get Spain off of his back for pressuring him about returning these Africans, and he didn't give a damn about the Africans one way or another. So he was going to do everything in his power to try to get them back. Even if the court ruled and proved that these, without a shadow of doubt, that these Africans, because this was the defense that they were setting up, that Montez and Ruins, they broke the treaty 
of the Anglo-Spanish Treaty of 1817, 1820, 1833, and 1835. And that these Africans were not born on a plantation of these individuals, but was recently kidnapped and illegally transported across the Atlantic Ocean. So he was going to do everything in his power, which you're going to see, which is going to cost him the election of being president again. So now, U.S. District Court opened Hartfield, Connecticut on November the 19th, 1839 to hear the case, but it adjourned to January because of asking a certain cardinal witness in the uh, interring the Spanish minister presses his claims once again and Faustus promised that he would get the ship ready to transport the captives to Cuba should the verdict go against them so that the abolishers would have no time to appeal. So if uh, they would have lost Faustus, the district attorney, or the, uh, um, he was going to already, he already had the ship ready to go, to go ahead and put these guys on the ship before the Amistad committee who set up a, a defense team for them, you know what I'm saying? Before they uh even appeal, they're going to be already shipped out. Um, so when the court resumed the hearing on January the 8th, January the 8th, the U.S. Navy schooner Krampus was in the New Haven Harbor. They had already put the darn ship in the harbor <laughs> and instructed the president, uh, instructions of the president, who many felt went a disgraceful extreme in the persistent attempt to thwart justice and proclamate by the courts. So the people in the North started to see whom the president of the United States is trying his best to sabotage uh, 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 do justice. Is trying to do everything in his power to get these Africans away from here, tried and convicted for murder because they were trying to liberate themselves and free themselves because they were illegally kidnapped by these Spaniards. And trying to satisfy the South because we know at, the, at that time the South was booming, and the South wanted the South was wanting slaves, and the abolition movement was prevalent in the North, and we know with the surgeons of these of the New Awakening, what they call the New Awakening in the 17th in the early 18th century, was these Christians who were starting to say, hmm. We have conquered these people in the name of our religions or Christianity. But in order to be a true Christian, it is not Christian-like to kidnap other human beings and traffic them and have them to work for free. So we want these human beings to be free. We don't want slavery. Slavery is wrong. It's not Christian-like. But through all throughout the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th century, it was normal behavior. It was business as usual to conquer, rape, pillage, destroy, break the people of natural resources and convert them to Christianity. The Portuguese told you this. I showed you with documentations and even them coming out of their mouth. If you go back and look at my Portuguese in the Congo uh, pre presentation. So now the three defense counsel urging the president not to have the case decided outside the courts in the recession of the cabinets where these unfriended men can have no counsel and can produce no proof. So they're seeing that if they ship back, the abolitionist movement, particularly the three, uh, uh, Lewis Tavern, uh, Leviticus and the other brothers still escape in my mind at this point. I talked about them in the other presentation. I mean, in the first presentation, they set up the uh, committees and actually raised money to get uh, uh, attorneys to fight um, for in on their behalf. But 
they start to see now that the the and and the people in the north that the president is trying to ship these Africans back where they will have no type of legal defense um at all and do not go through a through a do uh, a do and thorough process of the law to be proven innocent or guilty and have their side of the story told abolish is still so they knew what the president was trying to do with even if they was proven to be innocent the president still was going to ship them off so the abolition movement in fear of the president not even going to wait because they already look they got the u.s navy schooner uh, ship called the Krampus already set up set up at the new haven harbor so they were scared that before the court case on january the 8th because it was deferred right to January the 8th, that the president was gonna go in and have people to go in and already just go in and and, and, and uh, take the Africans out and go ahead and send them back uh to Cuba without even being tried. So the abolition stood watch and shift over the New Haven jails. They were afraid that the president might send men to seize the Amistad Africans even before the trial had concluded, and they were prepared to hide the captives if necessary second trial on january the 13th 1840 judge johnson finally rendered his verdict the amistad captains have been kidnapped and sold into slavery in violation of the spain spanish law they were legally free he said they were legally free and should therefore be transported back to Africa whence they had been taken against their will. During the trial, Sinkpe had made a favorable impression by giving detailed testimony through the interpreter, showing how he and his fellow Africans were kidnapped, bound and mistreated. Emotions overcame him at the one point and Sinkpe rose and shouted in English. So I want to show this little clip. And this is from the movie. I, I took it from the movie. I do see that the cargo went changed. They reduced the pound. And this is one of the attorneys that is talking to uh uh um the doctor member who's giving his testimony about the uh the legal kidnapping. And what poundage do you imagine the entry may refer to, sir? A mast and sails, perhaps. It is free. Give us free. Give us us free. Free. Your Honor, please instruct the defendant that he cannot disrupt these proceedings with such a give us us free. If we are to have any semblance of order in this court, Your Honor, give us us free. Give us us free. Crying out, give us free or anything else. Give us us free. I have my question that we're not. Give us us free. the emotions that he he got so emotional and, and and take in mind through the whole process you had a uh, sherman booth who was who also taught them while they was in jail 
a guy named Sherman Booth. You had Ray George, uh, George Davis, who also taught them, and the Professor Gills, who also taught them sign language and how to speak in English, because they did, uh, at earlier they only spoke Mindy. So he got so emotional. He said, "Give us free, give us free." I'm, I'm, I, I like that. But he, he said, "Give us free." So he got so emotional. So I just wanted to show that clip. And it's called the Amistad uh, uh, Puma At Ra. If you want the um, uh, the movie, let me know, and I'll uh, shoot it to you. Uh, if you want the movie, uh, and uh, yeah, if you want the movie, just and I'll, I'll shoot it to you. If you want the full movie, it was a good movie. It's uh, you're not gonna get all the information that I gave in part one, and in this part two, it doesn't go in full detail. It goes in some of the information but it doesn't go in full detail so i'm giving full detail of a lot of things that the movie didn't even talk about but some things that the movie talked about as well and it was a good movie my first time seeing it was last week i looked at it last week i was through with my presentation uh by the time i looked at it so uh it was good so here is a letter here from so okay well let's go back so and they was tried in the circuit court right then it was uh it moved to the district court. So you had Joseph Thompson that was over the circuit court. It moved to the district court up under Andrew T. Johnson. And then there was no evidence to uh prove that Montez and Ruins did not uh uh um um that the slaves were actually owned by them uh, before the treaties were set sail. So there was no proof established that these were slaves and not kidnapped. You know, so it was proven that they was kidnapped. They was kidnapped victims. They were not slaves already owned by these individuals before these treaties uh, was uh, uh, was put up. And the damaging blow was when the attorney, I mean, when the doctor, uh, Dr. Madden came in and he gave his testimony uh in the chambers as well as in the court about this was uh this wasn't this was normal behavior of illegal uh trafficking and the kidnapping of africans on the atlantic close uh, atlantic uh ocean and nicholas phillip who was a gov who is a part of the who is of the united states who is a government official who became a consul and we sent him over there to live to make sure that we do not break these treaties uh um um that uh, um 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 these these treaties and he 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 told him about the legal documents you know what i'm saying the birth certificates nicholas phillips was getting paid on the back end for looking over it you know what i'm saying turning the other cheek when these individuals he knew that these it was uh is these illegal legal trafficking of human beings across the atlantic ocean so that was another death blow and uh andrew du johnson set them free but take in mind um that that uh the president this individual here let's go back again go back this oh he look he look at him he he look wicked don't he he look at him he look wicked martin van burrow was the president at this time doing the amistad case now he 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 had already said whether they be proven innocent or not. He's shipping them off anyway. Whether they prove innocent or not, they going. It don't make a difference. If the court don't send them back, he's sending them back regardless because he's trying to get reelected and he need the South votes and he's tired of the Spain minister of Spain and Queen Isabella II are putting pressure on him. So now that they supposed to be free. Now this is doing the district court. Look, we're gonna see what happened. Now, here is a letter from um another former president. We're gonna talk about this former president. And this is a letter after that the they was ruled to be free. The uh, the the president immediately immediately appealed the case 
So now they got to go to the district court. So now the slaves was back recommend. They was back in jail. And Bond was set for Montez and Ruins to get out of jail if they wanted to get out of jail. Montez bailed out at first. Ruins stayed in jail for a little while because he was guilt. He felt guilty. He started to have a conscience. But then later on, he got tired of being in jail. And then he bond himself out of jail uh, as well. But Roger Bauman, Roger Bauman, uh, Sherman, Bo uh, not Sherman Booth, but uh, Reverend Charles Bennett Ray and Theodore Sedman was the three that was hired by the Amistad Committee, the abolishers, right? The abolishers. But uh, Roger Bauman did all the work. He only seeked, he only seeked, uh, seeked information and counsel from Theodore Sedwich and Reverend Charles Bennett Ray, who was a lawyer, but he was there uh, in the defense and he was the one who got to know these Africans. He was the one to went and visit who, who visit him? He is the one who established a relationship with Singbe Pe'e, who was the leader uh, of these Africans because they looked at him as a leader because of what happened when he was in Sierra Leone, when he killed this wild beast, he was already uh, looked at as the highest esteem. And then he was the one who set the insurrection of the revolt out by freeing his, his fellow Africans and then talking them to revolt against these, these uh, Spaniards on the La Amistad boat. And even when the U.S. Uh, Washington captured them up under Lieutenant C Commander uh, Godney, and he jumped overboard. And I talked about this in the, set, in the first presentation. And they retrieved him out of the water. When he got out of the water, he assembled all of the Africans, and he told them, that we need to fight right now again for our freedom because they sieging a, a ship. And when the people on the U.S. Washington seen how much power Singpe, uh PA had over them, they put him on the U.S. Washington ship, but they let him stay on the board while he watched the uh, La Amistad as they told the La Amistad uh, in. But now, in order to win the case, they this was a high profile case, so they needed a high profile individual to reside over the case. So they went after um, a lawyer. We're going to talk about who this lawyer is. And they had already Baldwin had already been seeking advice from this former president and former lawyer, but he did not want to help in the case. But eventually, he started you know, telling Baldwin and giving him advice for as you need to get the story from the Africans themselves. He was the one that actually built a uh, gave him the information to build the defense to get an interpreter, which was John Convey, who interpreted and also gave a deposition to the courts in behalf of the Africans and so forth. And then they wanted him to reside over it, uh, help Roderick Baldwin in this high profile case in the Supreme Court, um, in the Supreme Court. So, uh, Baldwin wrote a letter to this president, and we're gonna talk about this president in a minute. And this is the letter that the president, the ex president, is actually writing back to uh, uh, Roger Baldwin, who presided over the Africans' uh, uh, uh legal case. and. Man, it's some chicken scratch. You know what I'm saying? I tried to hotel uh, uh, Kwame, uh, brother Kwame. Um, so I tried to uh, blow it up as much as possible to read it. It was a little blurry if I blew it up anymore. And um, it's some chicken scratch. But I'm trying to provide as much uh, primary documentation uh, to bag up some things that I'm saying. And this is some chicken scratch here. And um, he's writing and now he's saying, and basically in a letter that he will help preside over the case to free the Africans. And he wanted to meet with Sing Pei P.E. because he heard so much about this leader uh, who uh, influenced these Africans to revolt on the La Amistad and even try to fight to their death once the, the ship was seized by the U.S. Washington 
and so forth. And Sing P PA was very smart. And he admired him for being smart because of, of the questions that he kept sending back before actually this ex-president slash lawyer who hadn't practiced uh, law in over 30 years. So this is specifically what this letter is talking about. Uh, this uh, was in 1840 because it took two years in order for them to actually get back to Sierra Leone. They was captured in 1839 and then they was, and they, well, I'm not going to spoil it. Let's get back into it. President Van Burden, which we knew that he said he's tired of being pressured by the Spanish minister. He was tired of being pressured by the council of the Spaniard Montez and and uh, who purchased four African little, uh, four African children, three girls and one boy. And we're going to talk about the three girls. Uh, and we're going to talk about Kale, which is the boy a little bit, because the movie don't talk too much about that. We even going to talk. I'm even going to talk about Antonio, who was the cabin boy who was uh, enslaved by the captain who got killed during the insurrection on board the slave ship. So I'm bringing out a lot of information that the movie didn't talk about. Even in my first presentation, I brought out some information that the movie does not talk about. Uh, uh, so we know the president said, regardless, if they tried in the district, they went through the circuit court, they went through the district court. If they proven innocent in the district court, he's shipping them back anyway. He already had, let's go back. He already had the ship already, the uh, what's the name ship already uh, on the, in the harbor. Where, where, where is, let me see where it's at. Let me go back. Trying to figure out what the name of it was. Uh, I went too far. I'm overlooking it too. I know I'm probably overlooking it. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, over, I'm overlooking it. Uh, hold on. Okay, right here. He already had the U.S. Navy schooner Krampus was already the New Haven Harbor and was instructed by the president. He was already regardless. And even on another slide I, I showed you, he said if necessary, he's going to take it in his own hands to ship them back regardless of what the verdict come out to be. Because, again, re-elections was coming up and he was trying to win the vote from the South. And we know how the South was about their slavery. and. He wanted the pressure off of his neck from the Spanish men as well as the the, the, uh, the Spaniard uh, Montez and Werner's uh, council. So President Van Bertel, and this is the, you know, in the second court, in the district court, they were declared free, right? But the president appealed it immediately and had the Africans locked back up and gave bail to Montez and gave bail to ruins, right? So now they got to go to the Supreme Court. And President Van Burrow, who ordered the district attorney, Hollenberg, to appeal immediately against the decision. Meanwhile, the Amistad captains will continue with their classes in reading and writing in the doctrine of Christianity. This is what they do. And again, Sherman Booth, was an individual who helped educate them while they was in jail and while they was out of jail, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, in the next upcoming slide, as well as Ray George Davis, who was a professor at the Institution of New York for the Deaf and Dumb, who came in and talked to them a little bit more about sign language and reading uh, 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 pictures and so forth as well as Christianized them and converted them over to their religion. And James Convey, who was a Mindy man who was kidnapped, later free, took back to Sierra Leone, then he joined uh, the, uh, the, naval, uh, uh, um, the Navy. And then he, uh, uh, the Professor Gibbs, who also uh, was a professor at, at the Yale Institution, uh, also uh, who learned how to speak one to 10 in Mindy who went aboard on the border, I mean, uh, on the docks and were counting the Mindy till he got the attention of someone who may understood what he was saying, who was, who it was John Convey 
who actually became the interpreter and gave the side of the Africans because they only had one side. And that was the side of the uh, ruins and Montez, who was the Spaniards who bought the 53 Africans. So John Convey translated Christian, Christian, Christian prayers into Mindy, followed by a short sermon and then instructed in English language. The best pupil was 11 years old, Kelly. That was the young boy I showed you in the sketch because during the trial, you had an individual that actually sketched some of the, um, the Amistad uh, 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 Africans, as they will call them, the Amistad Africans. So I showed you 22 sketches of some of the, in the, uh, some of the, some of the Africans. They are missing about 12. So I showed you some of the sketches of the Africans, gave you the names of some of the names, and I mentioned the boy, Kali, who was purchased by Montez. Remember, Montez purchased uh, four uh, African children for uh, $1,300. That was three young girls and one young boy. And that's that young boy right there, Kali, one of the four Amistad children who learned to read and write with surprising speed. But all of the Amistad captives were keen to learn. All of them learned, but Kali caught on real quick. I mean, quick. He learned to speak English quick. Uh, he learned uh, um, to comprehend things real quick. Now, the ex-president Adams, the third trial. Now, this is uh, uh, President Adams, uh, John Quincy Adams. Now, John Quincy Adams who was a prayer, who, who had been, been the president before and also who was a lawyer who practiced law, who was out of practice for 30, uh, was out of practice for 30 years. And they needed a high profile, a high profile, somebody high, high profile for this high profile case for the Supreme Court now. So eventually Baldwin convinced them and I showed you the letter. Uh, I didn't show you the letter. I actually thought I had the letter where Bauman wrote him, um, but I must have uh, deleted it because I did delete some uh, slides off of here. Um, so I might have deleted uh, a document that Bauman also wrote. And then here is the document that uh, John Quincy Adams wrote back to Roger Bauman, now agreeing to participate uh, uh, in this court case, in the Supreme Court case against these, these, uh, against these Africans. So and it and, it, and the case became president versus president. Uh, just getting in peace to everyone. Peace, 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 brother, brother Rand. Uh, appreciate you, man. Uh, for coming in and participate. Uh, yeah, and participate. Uh, the Amistad Committee recognized the need for the public figures of the highest standing to plea in the cause of the African captives before the United States Supreme Court. The abolishers persuaded former president John Quincy Adams to lead the defense, as I stated, at 73, at 73 and 30 years out of legal, which I stated practice, an ex-president was reluctantly accepted to the case. So again, this, as they went through the circuit court, went through the district court, was proven innocent, but the wicked uh, president appealed immediately and the uh, Africans was locked back up and Montez and Ruins was freed on bail. Montez uh, posted bail immediately. Ruins stayed because he so-called just started to develop some type of conscience. But then later on, he, uh, he posted, uh, he posted bail. And, um, and now they had to go to the Supreme court. And now they needed a high profile figure in the Supreme Court. So the court case, this third Amistad case within the Supreme Court now became, it was called president versus president. The president versus president. Because you have an ex-president, John Quincy, uh, 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 against um, uh, President Van Burton. Now, John, this is a picture uh, 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 of the ex-president, uh, uh, President Adam, John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams was seen as the perfect candidate to represent the many Africans before the, before the Supreme Court. He extensively experienced within the government 
he argued before the Supreme Court, negotiating uh, international treaties and abhorred slavery. The captive fate resisted on his ability to successfully preside their case of the Supreme Court. Quis uh, so again, Quincy Adams eventually took the case on and uh, he showed up to help uh, Bowman uh, in his third case. Thus, Adams accepted the sensational case that came to be called the trial of one president by another. At, at Attorney Bowman, who did all the work in the circuit court as well as the district court, the circuit court trial and the district court trial. We know we had other two attorneys, but Bauman just seek advice from Theodore Cedric and Reverend Charles Bennett Ray. Attorney uh, Bauman prepared an uh, uh, elaborate defense and opened the case, but on February the 24th, old man eloquence of Adams came to be called thereafter, addressed the court for a total of four hours and a half. So, he addressed uh, uh, the ex-president addressed the court for four hour, four and a half hours, and on Martin, and he was an eloquent speaker, and um, um, and he 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 made some valid points, which I started to put uh what he spoke about in the case, but that was just gonna be too long. He made a lot of valid points, and he persuaded uh the judge because even with the Supreme Court, the they manipulated. When we go back, let me go back and show you again real quick um, the judge. So now you have this judge, and then we was turned over to this judge, and then Joseph Story, which over the Supreme Court. Now, with the Supreme Court, we know this individual here, Andrew T. Johnson, he was the man that actually turned and uh, freed the Africans but they was immediately arrested because the uh, uh, the president, uh, Van Burrow, he immediately appealed the case and had them thrown back in jail because he wanted the Africans to go back without a, de a defense uh, um, to be tried in Cuba uh, um, for murder and piracy because these Africans revolted on this slave ship and wanted uh, uh, to free themselves uh, um, um, uh, uh, from being slaves. So now this guy was handpicked by the president. They went through so many different things and this individual, he come from the South. And again, the president didn't want to lose the vote because of the reelection from the South because we know how the South was feeling at that time and the Amistad Committee, the abolition movement or the uh, what they call the new awakening, as you look with the new awakening of the Quakers and these Christian people started to say that it is not Christian-like to enslave human beings. Most of these movements was in the North, and then you will see later on the, with the transpiring of the civil, this actually was at one of the historical events that set off 10 years later, set off the civil war against the North and the South. This is one of the events due to these uh, this insurrection of these Africans, specifically the people of of, uh, of, of, of the Mendy people or the Mendy tribe from Sierra Leone. And they handpicked this guy knowing the, the court. I mean, knowing they were saying, OK, we, this in the bag this time. These guys are this judge. The Supreme Court is going to say these guys are these Africans are guilty of murder and piracy and they should be immediately returned with the La Amistad ship and the cargo be returned to Cuba and uh, be returned to their Spanish uh, owners who illegally, which they weren't going to say illegally because we know Montez and Ruins broke the Anglo-Spanish Treaty of 1817, 1820, 1835, 1833, and 1835. So, so they thought they had it all in the bag. So let's go back, just trying to reiterate a few things. And that was on the uh, part of um, uh, part one. Let me see where I was at. All right. So uh, Adams accepted a sensational case that came to be called the trial of one president by another. 
Attorney Baldwin prepared an elaborate defense opening the case, but February the 24th, old man elegance. So I, I already talked about this. On March the 9th, 1841, the United States Supreme Court issued a final verdict in the Amistad case. The captives were free. The captives were free. So now the Supreme Court judge is now the evidence was there. The evidence was there that these Montez and Ruins could not prove that these uh, 53 Africans that they uh, bought was already slaves pr prior to these treaties. These individuals was, was recently kidnapped and these people was not slaves. They were African people who was just kidnapped illegally and transported across the Atlantic Ocean. And again, the death blow was from Madeline, who came and testified in behalf of, uh, of the Africans and the Amistad Committee that this stuff has been going on through times. And we have an official from the United States that we sent over on foreign land to, to live to make sure that we do not break the treaties and everything is on the up and up and nobody is illegally creating false documentations and transporting or kidnapping people from Africa and transporting them across the Atlantic Ocean. And he exposed Twist, another individual, that Twist, who had his hand all in the pot, who turned a blind eye and who was profiting from uh, illegal kidnapping uh, 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 Africans. So, he turned it over and said that they was free. Adam sent word at once to Lewis Tabby. Lewis Tabby, who is over the Amistad Committee, who is the abolishers, and the Amistad Committee, who later became uh, America Missionary Society, who actually, we're going to talk about who actually these people left after the people was freed. But look, they went, these Africans went through so much for two years. They went through the circuit court. They went, then they was freed in the district court. It was peeled. Then they went through the Supreme Court and then they was freed. And, and, and look, look what's going to happen. Lewis Taffy, the principal leader in the Amistad Committee. Thanks. Thanks in the name of humanity and the justice to you. Now, here, before I go any farther, this is a thank you letter. I, I'm trying to provide as much documentation or primary as possible. These are uh, letters that was written by Kali. Kali is the person I showed earlier in a drawing, a sketch that these people, the, uh, this sketch, I can't remember his name, they sketched the, the Africans that was aboard the La Amistad, and I showed you their names. I could have went a little bit further with their description, exactly what part of Sierra Leone uh, these Mindy people was from, and a few other people that wasn't from there, but I'm not, I didn't want to make it too, too, too long. Um, so Kali, remember Kali was one that Montez uh, uh, bought. These were the four children, the three girls, which they hadn't talked about. We hadn't talked about. And Kali, the 11 year old boy who caught on quick to learning English and comprehending stuff real quick. So and all of them was dual practicing by Sherman Booth, uh, Ray George Davis. Reverend Charles Davis and the and Professor Gills, they all taught them how to read and write uh, in English. And also they converted them to Christianity and taught them Christianity, taught them Christian prayers, uh, taught them how to read the Bible uh, and so forth during the whole time they was in jail in, in, uh, in Connecticut. This was a two year process. They was kidnapped in 1839 and in 1841, this is when they return to their homeland. So they have went through so much right now, but it still ain't over. But here is a letter that Kali wrote in behalf of all of the other Africans that have survived on the La Amistad ship and survived in jail in Connecticut, where they wrote a letter here thanking uh, John, uh, John Adams, the ex-president, the out of practice lawyer for 30 years who came in to help Bowman and the uh, Emma Star Committee, you know what I'm saying, win this Supreme Court case 
for the African. So here is a letter here. Uh, you can pause it later on and try to read it. It's all kind of chicken scratch, like with the other stuff I've been trying to show you, the other documents and writing I've been trying to show y'all. It's all chicken scratch. Um, the return home, the Africans were released from custody and taken to Farmington and early uh, Bosch's town in Connecticut, where they received more formal education for the rest of 1841. As the president, Vern Burrow, refuses, he still refuses to provide a ship. And he already had a ship aboard. He had the grumper ship already on the dock. And remember, the Amistad Committee was outside the jail after the, uh, the circuit court case. And they was finna get ready to go into the district court case. The second case, they was outside because they thought the president was going to have men to come in and seize them and just take them back before the case was even thing, before the case, before they was even tried. And even after that, he already said if they proven innocent or not, he going to, it's his power. He going to send them on anyway. He going to send them back. He going to send them back anyway. So now the Supreme Court, the judge has deemed them to be free because there he there has been a shadow of a doubt that these people was kidnapped and ruled and Montez broke the treaties of the anglo Spanish Treaty of 1817, 1820, 1833, and 1835. So now the president refusing to provide the ships to repatriate them. The Amistad Committee assumed completely responsibility for the Africans to raise funds to charter a ship. The Abashes organized a speaking tour in northern states, and the Amistad went from town to town, appearing before symptomatic audience, telling the story of their ordeal and displaying the knowledge of reading and spoken English. By this time, Sinkpe, or Joseph Sinkwe, we know his name was changed. Once he got over here, it was some fraudulent documents, this birth certificate, was fraudulently created with his name saying that he was already born a slave and they gave him a name. And, and another thing, what got him was during the court case, if these guys and these girls, little girls, was already, already slaves prior to 1817, why they couldn't speak no Spanish? <laughs> They tried to speak Spanish in the court. These guys couldn't speak Spanish. They were speaking that native tongue. And again, once we know, once we have been kidnapped, they strip you of your native tongue. They strip you of your name, your culture, your tradition, your morals, your edicts, and et cetera, et cetera. These 53 Africans couldn't speak a speak of Spanish. So how could they be born on the plantation already, your slaves, and they speak in the African language, Mindy language. Becoming a public figure in the United States, Sinkpe P.A., which is his real name, became a public figure in the United States. And many were nauseous to see the man who northern newspapers compared to the hero of ancient Greece and the Rome. Because there was numerous newspapers, and I showed you three articles from numerous uh, newspaper. Again, I'm trying to bag these things up with documentations on part one. So if you hadn't seen part one, you can go check out part one. And there were stories about Singpe. He was the leader of these guys, of these uh, Africans who revolted on this slave ship and even orchestrated them once they were seized by the U.S. or uh, Washington by the Lieutenant Commander uh, Godney. And he, he wanted them to revolt against them fight to the death if they had to. So they see how much influence that Sinkpe had over these Africans and the revolt and another revolt that was going to take place uh, where they was going to fight against these people that were seizing the ship at, uh, once they got to the land of uh, Long Island in New York City. So these, uh, they, so these uh, newspapers wrote many things about Sinkpe. So toward the end of the year, enough funds had been raised and the Bart gentleman was chartered for $1,840. The 35 surviving Africans would travel to a colony of Sierra Leone. Listen, 
accompanied by five American missionaries. Because again, the um, uh, the uh, American committee was established by the abolitionists, and before the uh, uh, Africans arrived there. Um, to the United States, which they was on their way to Port, a, a Puerto Rico princess, but due to the insurrection of the ship, they uh were supposed to have been going back home and Singpe ordered Montez to sail the ship where the sun uh, 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 um, in the direction of the sun because he knew the sun rises in the east, so he wanted them to go eastward. And at night, Montez would trick the Africans and turn the trip the ship around. And they will sail uh, the opposite way. And they did this back and forth. And I showed you a little calendar and a little zigzag pattern that they went through for two months. And they supposed to have been on the Atlantic for three for three days, but it turned into a two month trip. And they exposed it, and they ended up. Uh, they were supposed to have been going to uh, yeah, a Puerto Rico princess, but they ended up in the United States in New York. Oh. And go ahead. I didn't want to cut your bill, bro, but I want I want to uh, kind of add something very important into your presentation that uh, that many people are not thinking about when they when they talk about La Amistad. What makes what makes this case so important was the time period. This was the era of the illegal slave trade. You threw out a date. And if people were paying attention to any information that, that came before your La Amistad pre presentation, this date would tell you that this was a time where the, not only the slave trade was abolished, but this was a time that the illegal slave trade had taken effect. Hence, the reason that people were kidnapping, were still kidnapping people from the continent and taking them to the Caribbeans. They wouldn't come in directly to the Americas because it was illegal to dock your ship with the with these so-called cargo or these code names that they used. So they would go to Cuba and places like that, sit and then come north with the people and 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 try, you know, in the midst of that, trying to teach them their new names and all this other stuff to code it all the way up. So people have to put it into context because that's what makes this case so significant was that it happened during a time period of the uh, the illegal slave trade era. And and that kind of tilted his hand in favor of the Africans uh, that were aboard this particular ship. I just wanted to put that out there because a lot of people don't think about that, because when you throw out the date, they don't think they, they're still thinking whatever it is that they're thinking, but this was actually the illegal during the illegal slave trade era. Right. That, that's why I mentioned those, those Anglo-Spanish treaties and I'm um, throwing out these, you know, throwing out the date when they were kidnapped and so forth. So, you know, a lot of people follow me if they looked at the first presentation, you know, they'll be able to follow me and understand that everything that was happening was this was during the time of the illegal slave trade and uh, even what I showed you with with the other guy testimony, he this was business as usual. He was he was basically stating to the court, stating to the judge doing the district doing the district di district court case before the Supreme Court. You know, there's been fraudulent documents, there's been fraudulent birth certificates. We got a guy that we sent over here to supposed to be abiding by the law to make sure no things are happening with the illegal slave trade, but he got his hands all tied into it, and he's actually benefiting from it too. He's turning a blind eye and making money off of it too because he's letting these individuals um, do these things and I'll let you do these things as long as you break me off a piece of the pie. Because when he went there to be a consul, he also tried to set up his own sugar plantation which failed miserably. So since that failed, uh, Twiston, you know, just said, hey, look, I'm going to help in the process of uh, 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 making these fraudulent documents and turning a blind eye and helping y'all uh, illegally transport these slaves and kidnap these slaves. You know what I'm saying? Long as you give me, you know, you break me off some money. And he got wealthy off of doing this. Right. But to mm -hmm. add that there, there were still American ships that were converted 
to slave ships that were also participating in this in the same era. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to previous presentations where we show the shipping industry in the Americas, the last ship that actually went to Africa, kidnapped and brought them into the Caribbeans where they had the plantations still going. Mm -hmm. These people, instead of coming back to the Americas with Africans, they were just you know, dropping them off in the Caribbeans to continue to work the sugar plantations because this is when the sugar plantation was considered more valuable than gold at this time. So right. the resources and the, the content of the resources were very, were very important for those that were uh, exporting sugar from the Caribbeans. This gave strength and, and uh, might to the Caribbean area because they controlled uh, for once in this whole scheme of things, they control trade, which mm. they never really control trade until the illegal era. And you had these investors that were of the United States, some of them being from New York, Connecticut, um, a few other places up north, and then along the coastlines of South Carolina. And then um, I think one or two members was in Florida and then uh, Louisiana. Uh, someone had that. Um, I, You know, there's a there's a lot of information that kind of led up to this whole Amistad thing. And because of the people who got involved in it, it kind of made it come into fruition. But this was an era where these, like you said, it goes back to the treaties. It goes back to the er the illegal era. It's so many pieces to this puzzle. But go ahead, man. I didn't mean to break your bill, man. You no, 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 no. You good? You good? I mean, you adding on. You know what I'm saying? You adding on. You know, you adding on to the cipher. Ain't that what uh, brother Alice said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Peace, peace, of brother Alan too. Uh, yeah. So, um, um. So, you know, this here, you can see here, you can see uh, Syncpay PA, and you can see uh, them aboard the ship. And at this time, you got uh, the missionaries. They are, they're taking, they taking people with them. They say the missionaries want to go with them. We got to go over here, educate these people, and convert these people. So, again, the American Committee, uh, the American, uh, Amistad Committee became the American Missionary Society. And you look at, uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia, you will see a lot of schools set up. I'm gonna show two, you know what I'm saying, that's been uh been active for the last 50 to 60 years. I could have showed some more, but I just only showed these particular two. And I'm about to wrap it up too, family. And among the five were two black two black Americans, Mr. and Mrs. Henry Wilson, who had taught uh in Fapney, and three whites, Reverend and Mr. Williams Raymond and Reverend James Steele. The Amistad Committee instructed the Americans to start the Mindy Mission in Sierra Leone. Before the ship left, Louis Tabby addressed the passengers and Sinkpe replied on behalf of his fellow Africans. And I just gave a drawing. I uh, wanted to give the individual that did the drawing um, on here. Um, and I can't even think of the guy, the guy name. Okay, the Mindy Mission. It was not easy to find a location for establishing the mission station. It wasn't easy, family, because they wanted to try. Once these missionaries aboarded this ship and left with the uh the, the uh the kidnapped Africans, they wanted to set up a missionary school and so forth and spread the word or the gospel and educate these people in the town of Singpe. But by the time Singpe, they got back to Sierra Leone until his town, he was, um, he was, um, he was already, um, he was, uh, his, it was, uh, most of his people was gone. He, he went uh, on the first what's name. I, 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 I gave you some information about Singpe. He was married. He had two girls and he had one son. His, his wife was gone. His kids was gone. His, his family, his whole family was gone. And people in that era was gone. It was destroyed through warring and stuff. So it, it failed miserably. When they first got there to set up these missionary schools and convert the people, they was there for a while. And a lot of the uh, Mindy people and a lot of the Africans that went back 
they got um they you know they got they were disappointed and so forth so they ended up scattering off and they ended up going back into their hometowns and so forth this is what this slide is talking about because i don't want to read the whole slide so eventually they went off and then later on they established Sen senpei went on and uh he went to uh he left his town and went into sure uh cerebro uh, a region in 1844 and and he set up you know a form uh and search and search and then through the influence they 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 use Singpei to influence other people uh in this area in this region and they they uh, uh, uh later on they end up establishing the uh the many missionaries uh uh in the region where he where he was so when i just read it says the establishment of many uh missionary was the fact due to no small measures to the efforts of reverend raymond to whom every credit should be given in they in, in the course of time the missions opened stations in several places one which was named uh motabi and motabi was lewis tabby this was a rich merchant this was an abolishment where two other individuals that started the amistad committee who went to the defense of the uh africans that was aboard the amistad who raised funds for their legal defense and who also raised funds through them going on these speaking tours to raise money for them to leave after they was finally free going through these these process so one of the missionary schools was named after uh, uh motab uh, in in his gratitude um and uh let me see i'll read some of this in an amistad case rises the amistad missionary acted in sierra Leone with all the positive consequences the african missionary associate ultimately turned over missionary states in sierra Leone. Leon to the United United Brethren of the Christ. Upon the evangelist work, the UBC was responsible for establishing an expansion system of mission schools in the southern parts of the country, especially among the Mendes and the Shebron people, because this is where uh, um, uh, Singpei will eventually go amongst the uh, Shebron people. Who also was a mixture of people because I, I talked about that in the Bundy slash Sandy Society. And I'm gonna talk about this in this uh, Gala presentation. The Gala people, the G O L A, that come from Nedango uh, and Gangla, who ended up in um, Ghana and then eventually ended up in Liberia through the split. They ended up in Liberia and Sierra Leone and then came into the america south america north america and such and such and became the gala the g-u-l-l-a-g the descendants of the gala people but we'll talk about that and i'm going to talk about the merging of the mindy languages as well as the cerebrum the kissy the basa uh the corno and these other languages especially with the mindy people the mindy people took in other ethnic groups in Sierra Leone and they began to intertwangle and have the same type of culture and traditions and so forth. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next presentation, but I talked about that too uh, a lot in that Bundo slash uh, Sandy Secret Woman Society presentation. Many schools were established and many technology skills introduced parts of vocational training. The most celebrated of these schools are the Hartford School for the Girls of Moyambe and the Abbott Academy in Freetown in Sierra Leone. We know Freetown, uh, Sierra Leone was uh, established as a Freetown. It should be remembered as the Abbott Academy. Uh, founded in 1904 was the first secondary school upcoming by the boys predating the government boys school in the capacity of many years. And the many early students were promised boys and scholars. The long-term impact of these developments was helped create the elite group that excelled only in Sierra Leone, but in the United States as well. Some students who had their early education in American missions, schools in Sierra Leone proceeded to the United States for further studies. So you had two individuals who actually left after the missionaries these schools several missionary schools that was developed by the american missionary society who started out as the american committee first and then developed into the american missionary society set up these missionary schools 
and through them educating a lot of the a lot of the Africans in Sierra Leone and educating them, uh, teaching them about certain technology and so forth. You had some that went back into the United States for further study, and these were two individuals, uh, Bar 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 uh, Bar Bispa's Roots and Thomas Tucker. And we know that these guys was named. These was a Christian name. We know these was not their Pacific name. They wasn't their name. So, uh, and schools in Sierra Leone proceeded in the United States for further studies and left the mark in America. Two important examples are Bar uh, Barbismus Roots and Thomas Tucker. Roots and Tucker attended the original Mindy Missionary School, Mindy Schools. This was in Sierra Leone, and after completing further studies in the United States, were employed by the American Missionary Association, which was the American Committee, which was established by uh, Lewis Tabby uh, uh, um, uh, and two other individuals, a reverend and, an, uh, and uh, I think he was an emancipator or a writer or, or something. I can't think of his name. Tucker in 1862 as a teacher in the schools of freedom in Virginia and roots in 1873 as a pastor of the Congress Missionary Church of Freedom in Alabama. While Root later returned to Sierra Leone, Tucker, sta Tucker stayed. Tucker stayed. So here is a, and I'm going to go a little bit further, but here is one of the schools that they was talking about. We're still standing uh, that the uh, missionary of the American Missionary, uh, American missionary Society established and this was the Abbott Academy. This was the boys' school, the Abbott Academy in Freetown, Sierra Leone. And it, it, it had it, it can hold up around about 2,500 students. And this they, 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 they uh I think it's been established uh maybe 50, 55 or 60 some years. Now, here is another school. This is the school uh in Ferguson in Sierra Leone. This is the school for the girls, the all girls school, uh, the Miyambe. This is in Sierra Leone. This school houses about 450 students. And I think it's been in establishing for 55, maybe 60 years. But there are other schools that are there that were set up by the missionary school, the American Missionary, Missionary Society. So most of the celebrated of these schools are the Harford School of Girls of Miyambe and Abbott Academy of Freetown. I just showed you two of those schools. It should be remembered that Abbott Academy was founded in 1904, was the first secondary school upcoming the boys predating the boys' school. I talked about this long-term impact. These development was helped to create an elite group, excellent in Sierra Leone, but in the United States as well. I, I had that in another uh, slide. Some of the students who had who had their education in American Missionary School proceeded to the United States. I talked about that. Hold on. I wanted to get to something. I don't know. Um, let's see. All right. This is what I want to get to. So we know that one of the boys left and went back. Tucker attended original Mini Missionary School after competing further studies in the United States, were employed by American Missionary Society. Tucker in 1862 as a teacher in the School of the Freedoms of Virginia and the Roots in, in route in 1873, he was a pastor in the Cong Congressional Mission Mission Church in the Freedom of Alabama. While rooted later return root re returned to Sierra Leone, Tucker stayed in America and founded the State Normal College for Blacks in Tallahassee, Florida. Together with Thompson Van Gibbs in 1887, Tucker was the first president. Of the college, which grew into the pre uh, grew into the pre present day Florida A M University. So when you talk about Florida A and M U University, um, it goes back to the it it is it's, it's trying to give credence or credence to these missionary schools that were set up in Sierra Leone um, after um, uh, these uh, Africans was returned, set up these missionary schools with the affluence of Sing Pei. PA with some of the other Africans, but some of them got patient, uh, un, unpatient, and they returned back to their families. But some stayed, helped with the educational uh, process of these individuals, teaching them English, technology, teaching them about Christianity, uh, spreading the gospel, and so forth. And then two individuals went farther into the United States for education. And then you had a one went back, and then another one who established the school. The state normal college, and then be, it be, eventually became Florida AME, where he became the president. At 
So this is where one of the institutions was set up by, you can say, an a, a African from Sierra Leone. And in the 20th century, American missionary actors helped give rise to national elite, which praised press for independence. Significant, the prime minister of Sierra Leone, later Milton Margra, the first excellent president of Sierra Leone. C uh, Sika Stevenson was both products of American missionary primary schools in southern parts of the uh, country and later uh, graduated at Avery High School. So later you had through these missionary schools, you had some of the Sierra Leone uh, Africans um, um, became president over Sierra, uh, Sierra, uh, Sierra Leone. And we know Sierra Leone was colonized at one point of time. All right. The impact of the United States, by the time the Amistad came to an end, it had admitted feeling between the anti-slavery and the slaveholding South. It must be counted as an event leading to the outbreak of American Civil War, which, you know, it sparked the Civil War 1860. Although the Supreme Court decision of the Amistad case was not an attack on slavery, it drew the abolishers together. Because, again, in the first presentation, I told you that they was in disarray. The AMM also created the Hampton Fish in the Howard. Yes, um, I think I got that in here too. Peace, peace to you, uh, brother, uh, true historian. Um, dang, I lost where I was at. Um, so, oh yeah, in the first presentation in part one, I told you that the abolition movement was in disarray uh, prior to uh, the Africans leading um, uh, up to Long Island in New York. They, they was arguing and they was in disarray. The movement was separated. You had different entities and factions all over because they was arguing over politics. They was arguing over the church. They was over arguing over women rights and et cetera, et cetera. And this case, the Amistad case of these Africans coming uh, are coming in and the Amistad committee formed, um, it actually brought the Abasha movement back, um, back together. And then the Amistad committee develop into the American missionary uh, 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 missionary society. Moreover, the missionary work that began the freedom of the Amistad Africans lead to the foundation of the American Missionary Association, what I talked about, I said society, but association in 1846 was larger and the best organized abolishing society in the United States before the outbreak of the Civil War. After after the broader states of the education of newly liberated blacks, these schools involved into Atlanta, Howard, Fisk, and Dillard University, Hampton University, uh, Talladega College, etc., to which countless black Americans own these higher educations. The Amistad case thus gave rise to the tremendous network of institutions in the South that educated the leaders of the modern day civil rights movements, including the uh, uh, venerable Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. My conclusion, the Amistad Rebellion, which begins with the determination of Singpe P.A. Uh, and the 52, which is a typo, was supposed to have been 53, 53 of the Sierra Leones uh, not to accept enforced slavery has had for reaching consequences on two centuries. Although the origins are mostly forgotten today, the process setting motion by the revolt will continue to influence the course of historical development in both the United States and Sierra Leone. So, uh, oh, and this just, I'm through with the presentation, but uh, we didn't talk about the girls, and I'm just gonna give some brief information on the the, the, the three girls, and I talked about the boy Kali. Uh, but the three girls they did not mention. Uh, they didn't. I, I, they uh, some of the documents did not mention. I, I I found a few things, but the Amistad, the Amistad was eventually it was sold in New London, New London, Connecticut, uh, in 1840. The ship and the cargo, which was worth six thousand dollars, the ship was worth. Only $245, the ship was loaded with cargo consisting, among other items, four filing pieces, 11 box crockers, 200 box of basilicus, whatever that is, one case of sugar, 25 baked beans, 50 horse equipment, five saddles, 20 hides, uh, sole leather, six iron drums for war warehouses, shirt tapes, threads, tiles, umbrellas, 29 
uh, Muslim dresses, patterns, 16 woven shackles, etc. Lieutenant Godfrey received $400 for the capture of the Amistad and other officers in the crew received smaller portion. So, yes, this was the lieutenant commander that I talked about on the U.S. Uh, Washington that actually sieged uh, the La Amistad and the Africans on, uh, on there and sent word to the district attorney and got Judge Andrew T. Johnson to aboard the ship to observe and examine the uh, the ship and get the testimony from uh, the two Spaniards, Montez and and uh, and ruins. Um, um, uh, shoot, I forgot what that was. Um, the Reverend, uh, and here is just another Reverend. You know what I'm saying? Just just showing you that this Reverend here, Reverend Leonard Beacon, which I've been in, in, reiterating through the whole thing of them teaching these Africans. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, Sherman Booth, uh, Reverend Charles Booth Ray, Ray George Day, uh, and the Professor uh, Professor Gibbs, they all taught the African English how to speak, how to write, and they evangelized them and converted them into Christianity, taught them uh, prayers, their prayers in Mindy. They had John Convey, who was the interpreter, who taught them how to pray in Mindy and, uh, and so forth, and he helped to educate and evangelize the Amistad captives while they were in jail. And also Sherman Booth educated them too while they was in jail. And as they was free from a turnover during the Supreme Court, he also uh, uh, educated them in Fortman, Connecticut, where they went uh, 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 in the uh, in the Abolisha town, uh, where he trained for free these blacks to go to Africa to evangelize the growing colonies for the former American slaves. So that was, that thing too was to go back. That's why they set these American missionaries um, with them into to evangelize uh, and to educate um, these people in uh, Sierra Leone. And this is Antonio. Remember, you had Antonio, who was a slave of the Captain Farrell, and you had Sustilio, if I'm pronouncing his name right, who was the, a cook, who also was a slave of the Captain. And the revolt was set off, if you go back to my part two presentation, Sustinio made a joke. And Sustinio was saying that uh, what was going to happen to them was these Spaniards was going to kill them, cut them up, and eat them. You know, and this was also, you know, motivated Sinkpe also to free himself, free the other Africans, and insurrect. And due to the process of Sustinio uh, joking, they killed him. And and the and they killed the captain, but the cabin boy Antonio they don't talk about Antonio that much. So Antonio he was a cabin boy, and they wanted he was waiting to be returned. He wasn't locked up in jail in Connecticut with the other what's his name. He became a jailer. So once he became a jailer, and he was waiting to be returned back to Cuba. You know what I'm saying? Um, his 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 owner Captain Ferrer was already killed. So as he was waiting, he the process was a long time. He was a jailer. They kind of mistreated him as well. Um, he eventually escaped because he started, he wanted to go back, but then he got a taste of freedom. So he he escaped and I, he escaped and he went to Canada. I think he went to Canada first and then he ended up in Montreal. They say that it was some abolishers, uh, 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 um, someone that knew Louis Tavi, who was over the uh, Amistad Committee, who helped him uh, go into Canada and then went and uh, where he was from, uh, I mean, established in uh, Montreal. So this was the cabin boy that was also on the ship that, you know, you don't hear too much about or him being locked up with the other Africans. Uh, and then the girls. Remember, I talked about the girls, They, the girl and the boy, the 11 year old boy. They actually doing the circuit court. They was asking that these girls be released, but they did not release. Um, they did not release the girls, and they didn't talk much about the girls or the girls being in jail and so forth with a lot of the documents. So this was another jailer, this uh, Stanley Pinglin, who uh, he made money um, um, by getting uh, having people to come into the jail and look at. Um, Look at uh, these Africans in jail. So he made money by letting people come and visit and look at the Africans like it was some type of show. But also he took in these Mindy girls. You know what I'm saying? He employed, uh, let's see, 
they were not, they were, these girls were not given educated. They was not educated like the, uh, the, uh, um, the other Africans was educated because they were secluded. They was not in jail with these other girls. Remember Sherman Booth educated on Ray Joyce Davis, Ray Charles Bennett Davis and the professor, uh, Professor Gibbs and so forth, they the ones that educated them, taught them as well as James Convey, who was a Mende person as well. Um, but uh, the Mende girls, uh, uh, girls as they, they actually were the Mende girls was his servants in the kitchen. They were not giving education. His wife said it would be pointless to teach them sewing as they were so soon to go back to Africa where they went naked. And Judge finally removed the girls from the jailer's household and made Amos Townsend their guardian. So these girls was actually housed by one of the jailers and his wife, and they mistreated these girls and they did not educate these girls, but these girls was eventually uh, released. So I just wanted to throw that in there. And then this is it. I'm wrapping it up. This is uh, a memorial of Sing Pay Pay E. Uh, this is a, uh, what you can find uh, in New Haven. Uh, this is a permanent home of the Am 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 Amistad Memorial uh, in front of the New Haven City Hall. And this is actually in front of the, the New Haven Hall. It's actually the place where they resided in the court cases, the district court. I mean, the circuit court, the district court and the Supreme Court is. So this is right. This memorial is right across the street, uh, uh, right across the street from there. Um, um, so. I just wanted to show that I, I wish I could have got a, another uh, 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 blew it up where one fly you can see where he was very emotional and he said, uh, you know, give us free. You know, when he got very emotional. I showed you the clip in, in the movie part. So I think that's on the part down here and some other things about our sync pay PA. Um, so uh, here are my um, my references here. Um, I'll leave it here just for a second. Um, again, I don't have a problem with you scrutinizing my references, going through my references. I don't have no problem with critique. You know, I say it every time in my uh, presentations, I get asked why I always give uh, a disclaimer. Uh, I hope uh, y'all enjoyed the presentation. It was pretty lengthy. Part one wasn't that lengthy. This one was a little bit lengthy. You know, I had to break it down into uh, two presentations. Here is the rest of the references. On this page, you had a full page and almost a half page of references here. I done a lot of reading. This was a, a whole bunch of hours of research because I wanted to add more information and bring more information to the surface, try to find different documents uh, during the court case, the writings back and forth from Bauman to uh, to the judge and um, so forth. So I hope you all appreciate it. I was kind of. Um, quiet on Facebook because I was trying to do like a lot of reading. I had a few uh, books um, that I wanted to try to knock out. Then I found another book and then it was a few good articles that I came across. And then uh, I am my brother's keeper shot me a few things. So I wanted to try to read that. And then after I got through, I wanted to try to look at the movie to see that I nailed the presentation, which I I did more than that because the, pre the my presentation deal with more information than the movie did. Uh, again, I'm a part of, uh, 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 so please go subscribe to, uh, the Seshuma Ami Metaneta. I am a group. Uh, I'm a member of the Seshuma Ami Metaneta. Uh, we are individuals that are like-minded, uh, who deals in the language, which is the Ronnie Kimmett and the writing system, which is called the Seshuma Ami Metaneta. Uh, so please go subscribe to our channel. We have a lot of content on the channel. Please subscribe, go support. Also, if you're watching, please go subscribe to please subscribe to my channel. If you have not already subscribed to my channel, please support me uh, and my channel. My channel is a new channel, but please support me. If you support me, I'll support you back. Um, also, I'm a member of the Mossy Warrior Clan. So please go subscribe to the Mossy Warrior Clan. Um, be on the lookout uh, this Sunday. Since Sean has a presentation that he's going to do. And then followed by another presentation. Uh, I, I should have wrote them down, the name of the presentation, which would be on the Mossy Warrior Clan. Be also be looking for the Poro presentation by brother, uh, by our brother uh, Benjamin Now. I did the Sandy slash ben, uh, slash, uh, Bundo slash Sandy 
uh, a Secret Woman Society presentation on the Mossy Warrior channel, but it's also on my channel as well. So you can watch it on my channel, or you can go to the Mossy Warrior channel. And the the it's the opposite of the Sandy Society. It's the Poro. It's the Man Secret Society in Sierra Leone and Liberia. So be looking out for that presentation by Brother Ben. Also be looking out for a presentation that also going to be on the Marcy Warrior channel in the next week or so. Um, also, um, I have no name for it, but again, it's dealing with the Gala people, the G-O-L, the Gala people from the Dongo, from and what we call Angola, from Central Africa. And uh, uh, so I'm going to talk about the Gala people from Central Africa that went into Ghana, that eventually went into, uh, that, that caused a split. There was all who the Gala had a Gala empire who was also a part of the Mali empire. And then there was a split. And then you, you had the Gala people that went in Liberia and the, and the Gala pe people that went into Sierra Leone. And then when the rice started popping off uh, in the south in uh, Alabama, um, not Alabama, but Georgia and Georgia and, uh, and uh, North Carolina, and South Carolina. These people were specifically targeted the Sierra Leone. I talk about the many people in the Sandy Bundy Society as well as this society. They were farmers. They had rice. They had rice. Uh, 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 they had rice farms. So these specifically people was targeted specifically the Gala people, the Mendy people, the Kissy people, the Kano people, the Basa people, and so forth. I'm going to talk about. Uh, a little bit and how the people in South Carolina and North Carolina and even the people when they went into uh, Jacksonville, Florida, who we call the black Seminoles who intertwine with the Seminole people. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to talk about all that in the Gullah, in my Gullah, G-O-L-A and my Gula uh, presentation. I don't have a name for it, but be looking out for it. It'll be full of information. Uh, so Please subscribe to that channel. You don't want to miss none of those presentations. A lot of those are going to be powerful presentations. Again, I want to say Moriri. Moriri means appreciate in the Yoruba language or appreciation. So I appreciate y'all for tuning in and rocking out with me. Uh, I want to say Dua, or Dua U, Dua U uh, in the session of the it, it, or in the Ronnie Kimmett language, it only means thank you or thank you very much. I thank y'all uh, 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 for supporting me. Uh, again, you support me. I support you back. I appreciate y'all. So please go subscribe to those three channels. If you have not already subscribed to the channel, please do. Cause I have folks that come and look at the presentations and don't even subscribe. Um, before I get out of here, I see Satip and Rod here. Satip and Rod, do you want to say anything? And then after Satip and Rod, Tim Sean, you want to say anything? You know, um, you know, now is the time. And again, I hope everybody appreciated the presentation. I'm home with you. Yeah, yeah, it was a good yeah, song, man. Song, man. I liked it. Like it. I, uh, uh, I remember watching this, uh, the Amma style when I was in, uh, I was in grade school when we watched it. They made us watch it and we had to do like a little, no, matter of fact, I think I was in high school and we did a little report on it or whatever. So I'm familiar with it. And, uh, I definitely think you brought out some, uh, some good highlights, some good points that, uh, wasn't in the movie. You know what I'm saying? So you definitely, brought that memory back and added on to it. So I definitely like this presentation because like I said, it was something I was familiar with before I came into the knowledge. So uh, great job. You got it, Tim? Yeah, you want to say something before I close out? Saying, Sean, you still in here? I guess he have left. Let me, let me say something. Let me say something to what Sam Sean said earlier too. <clears throat> I didn't like Sean was saying something about slavery was abolished at the time. So back in school, I didn't know that. So I'm thinking I didn't know what the, I didn't know what the movie was about. Honestly, I just I just thought it was another slave movie. So Sean brought up a good point earlier when he uh, interjected with that statement. So I just want to let him know that was a good good point he brought out. Okay. Well, family, I'm stinking because I started late. I wanted to start on time, but I went and shot ball with my dad and you know a few people. So I had to go get it in and school a few people. Uh, <laughs> so I came right in stinking and started the presentation. I'm starving. I'm hungry. Uh, again, I uh, 
I want to say Dua Dua U uh, and Moriri uh, Du Dupe, and that means uh, 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 appreciation. I mean, uh, uh, th uh, thank you very much also. So on that note, I want to say Shimon Hotep. I said ETM Hotep in the beginning. ETM Hotep means come in peace. Now I want to say Shim M. Hotep. It means to depart in peace. So see y'all next time. So be looking forward for those presentations that I throw out. Those presentations will be on the Masi Warrior channel. Send Sean two presentations. One this Sunday. I don't know which one's coming after that one. Uh, uh, ben, Brother Ben, Benjamin Now, a.k.a. Black Panther, is working on his Poro uh, Secret Man Society uh, presentation, which is going to complement my presentation that I already did, the bundle slash Sandy. A Secret Woman Society. If you hadn't looked at it, you can look at it on the Mossy Warrior channel, or you can go to my channel and you can look on it. Um, look on it uh, now, um, and also be looking for for my Gullah presentation. I don't have a specific name, but I'll be going through a lot, a lot of stuff leading up to the Gala of the Gala Geechee people in North Carolina. But I have to establish who is the Gala people, the G O L A people is, and what they did, and and I'm going to show primaries of bills of sales of them actually targeting these group of people in Sierra Leone because they was already special in Liberia and Sierra Leone of cultivating rice because they had rice farms already and rice has started booming on the rice plantations in the south. But be looking, so stay tuned to that. That won't be on this channel, which I may upload it later on, but it'll be on the Masi channel for a while. So Shimim Hotel family. Man in the full knowledge of himself is a superb and supreme creature of creation. When man becomes possessor of the knowledge of himself, he becomes master of his environment and captain of his own ship, the director of his own destiny, the accomplisher of his own ends. Man should understand himself because man is full of knowledge and this knowledge is a gift of nature. When Mother Nature created man, she deprived him of nothing. He was given the faculty of understanding all things around him. This faculty for understanding has not been taken away from him. None of his senses have been taken away from him. So there is no excuse for the black man. I'm breathing my team, my green, black and green, the queen, the king, the loop, now green, I share. Spring from the loop, the energy, I share. I'm ripping my team, red, black, and green, queen, and king, salute, now spring, I shake, spring, purple, love, and energy, I shake, fire, purple, and green,